So this is our first chapter six video. There will be another chapter six video as well. This one's going to cover metabolism, energy, thermodynamics, endergonic and extragonic reactions, um, work, and ATP. So metabolism is really the sum of all the chemical reactions carried out by an organism. And metabolism requires enzymes to occur in a timely fashion, but we will talk about enzymes coming up a bit later. Um, but basically we can talk about anabolic pathways or anabolism, which those are the reactions that build organic molecules. Um, this requires energy to occur. So maybe you've heard of anabolic steroids before. I'm definitely not recommending that you take them, um, but the reason they're called anabolic is because they build muscle. So they're um, building molecules. So for example, protein synthesis from individual amino acids would be an example of anabolic reactions. Catabolic reactions, on the other hand, or catabolism, are reactions that break down organic molecules. They release energy when they break these molecules apart. And an example of this would be in cellular respiration, which we'll talk about more coming up later in this unit. Um, and cellular respiration is basically like the breakdown of organic molecules like glucose in order to obtain um, ATP. And we also get carbon dioxide and water from this reaction. So cheesy pictures on the side. I've got some dogs lifting weights for anabolic reactions. And then I always think of cats as a little bit destructive, you know, pushing things off of counters and the like. So catabolic reactions are breaking things down. So energy is the capacity to cause change. Basically living things need energy in order to maintain their order. Um, kinetic energy and potential energy are two kind of big types of energy you've probably heard of before. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion. Um, thermal energy is a type of kinetic energy that's associated with the random movement of molecules. Um, remember, atoms and molecules are always moving, even in solids. Um, and then heat is just thermal energy transfer from one object to another. Potential energy is the energy due to structure or location. Um, so chemical energy is just a type of potential energy that is available for release in a chemical reaction. So this energy is stored in the molecular bonds. So that brings us to thermodynamics, which is the study of energy transformations. Um, living things are open systems, so energy and matter can be transferred between the system and its surroundings. Um, we can explain these transfers using the law of thermodynamics. There's two laws we'll talk about. I don't care that you memorize which one's the first law and which one's the second law. Um, if you take physics, they can do that for you there. But anyhow, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy can be transferred or transformed but it cannot be created or destroyed. Um, this is often described as the principle of conservation of energy. The second law of therm thermodynamics says that during every energy transfer or transformation, some of the em energy is going to be transformed to heat. So oftentimes people will say that energy is lost as heat, but again, we can't really create or destroy energy, so it's not truly lost. Um, but this is saying that every energy transfer increases the entropy of the universe. Um, there's a couple pictures from your textbook there. Um, apparently the bear eating the fish up there on the first picture is showing that the bear is getting chemical energy from the fish. Um, and then the bear moving, it's showing you like the bear is running, right? He's giving off carbon dioxide and water and he's moving and some of the energy from the chemical energy um, that was transferred to the movement in the bear is um, given off or kind of lost as heat. So that brings us to entropy. Entropy is really the relative amount of disorganization. Um, and really the only way to bring about order is to add energy in. So if we look at the two stacks of bricks there um, in the slides, if you were to um, look at the first stack of bricks, it's just, just jumble of bricks and the second stack of bricks is neatly arranged. So if we had our first stack of bricks, in order to get them to look like the second stack, we have to do work. We have to add energy in. Um, they're not just going to arrange themselves that way. So really the energy provided by the sun allows plants and other photosynthetic organisms to make glucose, which is more organized um, from the more disorganized water and carbon dioxide. Um, so some of the sun's energy is 
kind of lost as heat. It's not really lost, but that heat doesn't go into organizing the water and carbon dioxide into a glucose or simple sugar molecule. So that brings us to intergonic and exergonic reactions. Um, these are terms that can be used to describe reactions. So an intergonic reaction describes a reaction that re requires a net energy input um, and energy will ultimately be stored in the products. An exergonic reaction describes a reaction that releases energy by breaking bonds. And the concept of free energy can be applied to the chemistry of life's processes and a process is spontaneous and can perform work only when it's moving towards um, chemical equilibrium. So um, if we look at these pictures here, these are kind of common ways to show you or illustrate energy. Um, the first series of images, we've got a diver on a diving board and a diver jumping off the diving board. Um, in the state where the diver is on the diving board, there's more free energy there. It's less stable and there's greater capacity to do work. Um, and then when the person is jumping off the diving board, there's less free energy available, um, it's more stable, and there will be less capacity to do work. Um, in a spontaneous change, the free energy of the system de decreases and the system becomes more stable, and that released free energy can be harnessed to do work. Um, if we look at the second example, this is supposed to be a representation of molecules um, and kind of a representation of diffusion. So in the first image, we've got molecules that are very close together. And in the second image, the molecules are further apart. Um, remember that with diffusion, the molecules are bouncing off of each other and that random molecular movement allows the molecules to go from a high concentration to a lower concentration. Um, and they continue to move in the lower concentration area. However, they're not bumping off of each other. So there's um, less work capacity in that area where there's a lower concentration of molecules. Um, in the third series of images, we've got a large molecule and the second image is that molecule broken apart into smaller molecules. So there's more free energy stored in those chemical bonds and that is less stable in that larger molecule. So that molecule can be broken apart to release energy, which can do work. Um, and then the second image with the smaller molecules there, um, that's more stable and there's fewer bonds that can be broken in order to do work. So let's review um, which of the following images represents kinetic energy. So we've got a person with a ball and in the first picture they've dropped the ball and the ball is um, going off of this either giant stair or small cliff. It's hard to say what they're standing on. And then in the second picture the person is holding the ball over the either giant stair or small cliff. So hopefully you said the first image where the ball is dropped because the ball is moving in that image. You can tell by the giant arrows, right? Um, so the first image is kinetic energy and the second image is potential energy. So let's look at the second question. In the second question, we've got two different series of graphs. Um, and we wonder which one is representing an endergonic reaction. So in the first series, we've got um, our reactants and then we're releasing energy and we get our products. In the second in it, um, the second graph set, we've got our reactants and then to get our products, we have to add energy in. So with that in mind, um, the second one or B is the endergonic reaction. So oftentimes in living things, um, your energy releasing reaction or your exergonic reaction is coupled to or linked to an energy requiring or endergonic reaction. So cells are not really in equilibrium. Um, they're open systems, so they um, lose things and gain things all the time. Um, but again, in living systems, oftentimes reactions are coupled together. Um, and oftentimes the energy releasing reaction is going to be ATP hydrolysis. Um, what is hydrolysis again? So remember hydro is water and lysis is breaking apart. So ATP hydrolysis is just breaking apart ATP. Um, so we're going from ATP, so adenosine triphosphate 
to ADP or adenosine diphosphate. So from three phosphate groups to two phosphate groups on that molecule. Um, there's a couple pictures here that are trying to show you coupled reactions. The first one, we've got two wagons hooked together. Um, one wagon is being pulled uphill and the other wagon is rolling downhill. So that picture is trying to show you that the wagon, the wagon rolling downhill um, pulls the other wagon uphill. So going downhill would be energy releasing or spontaneous and going uphill would require energy. But since they're coupled together, the wagon going downhill can pull the wagon uphill. Um, I think most students do okay with that first picture. The second series is a little bit more far-fetched. We've got a cannon, we've got a cannonball, we've got a wagon with like a cannonball receiving hitch kind of thing. And um, basically they're showing you that the cannon is fired and the cannonball um, bumps into the wagon and pushes the wagon uphill. Um, so that's kind of like what happens with ATP. Um, ATP will release a phosphate group due to ATP hydrolysis and when that phosphate group binds to another molecule that activates the second molecule. Um, so that's what they're sort of showing you in that picture below. So that brings us to the structure of ATP. So ATP has an adenine molecule and then it has ribose, which is a five carbon sugar. Um, and the adenine and the ribose part, that doesn't really get changed in the ATP cycle. Um, and then ATP has a chain of three phosphates or phosphate groups attached to that ribose sugar. Um, and so if we have ATP, that's adenosine triphosphate, that has three phosphate groups. If we have ADP, the D is for di, meaning two phosphate groups. And then AMP, what do you think the M stands for? Right, mono. So adenosine monophosphate would have one phosphate group. So as far as the function of ATP goes, lots of people will say ATP is um, energy, but ATP is not technically energy. It's more like the energy currency a cell uses because between the phosphate groups, um, there's a high energy bonds. So when we hydrolyze ATP or break off a phosphate group, um, that is going to release energy and that energy can be used to kind of drive other reactions. Um, so be careful and don't say that ATP is energy, um, rather the energy is stored in the bonds in the molecule itself. So ATP can be utilized for a number of tasks within the cell. For example, ATP hydrolysis can help um, a transport protein pump a solute across the cell membrane, or ATP can be used to move or help motor proteins move a vesicle um, along a cytoskeleton track. Um, and there's really three types of cellular work that ATP can be used for, mechanical work, transport work, and chemical work. And they're all powered by the hydrolysis of ATP. So again, in this slide, we've got the AMP, which we can do dehydration synthesis, add a phosphate group onto and get ADP. So now we've got two phosphate groups and we can do dehydration synthesis and add another phosphate group on. So now we have three phosphate groups. So we would have ATP um, and you can do hydrolysis to go the other way. So you can go from ATP with hydrolysis to get ADP um, and then you can do hydrolysis again to go from ADP to AMP. So ATP is really a renewable resource. We can regenerate ATP by adding a phosphate group to ADP. Um, and there's two big ways we can do this. We can do substrate level phosphorylation or oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis. And really we're gonna talk about the specifics of how this occurs later on in this unit. But basically in substrate level phosphorylation, um, the energy that's required to add the phosphate group to ADP to get ATP comes directly from the catabolism or the breakdown of a carbon compound. Um, the next way we can make ATP is oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis, um, which that's what the picture on this slide is showing you. Um, basically in that picture, we've got a membrane, you've got a hydrogen ion concentration gradient, and you've got this crazy looking purple protein 
complex, which kind of acts like a windmill. Um, and oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis works by having the protons pumped across this membrane. Um, actually, they're not really pumped. They're more like, they more like flow across the membrane um, because of the concentration difference on either side of the membrane. So as these protons go across um, this pump in the membrane, the pump is going to turn much like a windmill would turn or a water wheel would turn. Um, and that turning provides the energy to add the phosphate group to ADP to produce an ATP molecule. So let's review. Um, number three, the energy to synthesize ATP comes from chemical reactions that are blank. Are they exergonic or endergonic? So this one is a little bit tricky. Um, to make ATP, making ATP is an endergonic reaction. However, where do we get that energy from? We get that energy from exergonic reactions. So the answer to this question is A, exergonic. Number four, ATP hydrolysis provides the energy to drive cellular processes that are blank. Is it A, exergonic, or B, endergonic? So what is ATP hydrolysis again? Remember, hydrolysis is the breaking apart. So this is when we're going from ATP to ADP. Um, and so when we break apart ATP, we are releasing energy. So that is going to um, drive processes that are endergonic or energy requiring. So B is the answer for number four. So in this video, we talked about metabolism, um, the chemical reactions within an organism. Um, we talked about energy and the laws of thermodynamics. And then we talked about endergonic and exergonic reactions, um, which again, endergonic is energy requiring, exergonic is energy releasing. Um, and we talked about work and ATP as well.